Uh, and I'll tell you what I mean by that in simple English momentarily. But the idea here is just that we need to feel not only that life is meaningful, but that we as individuals are, are persons of value. All right, what Becker does then is to take these two things and to combine them in order to generate his definition of self-esteem. What Becker says, hey, that's what we're talking about when we talk about self-esteem. Self-esteem is the belief that you are a valuable member of a meaningful universe. All right, you see what he's doing? He's taking these two ideas and he's combining them in a way that says that when you have value plus meaning, that you feel good about yourself. That's self-esteem. And that self-esteem is the psychological construct through which culture exerts its anxiety buffering influences. All right, now, that may not have made any sense, kind of obscure, but let's pass that on and, and talk about a, a few other ideas on our way to doing these other things. Thing number one is to note that according to this analysis, every one of us needs self-esteem in all times and places. Self-esteem is of central importance. In fact, Becker declares uh, that it is the dominant human motive uh, and that ultimately, though, it's serving a defensive function, which is to reduce anxiety. But one of the interesting and I think frighteningly provocative implications of this analysis is that while we all need self-esteem, the way that we get it is always relative to the time and place that you happen to be existing in. Because that which would convey immense regard in one social milieu might have quite the opposite effect uh, in another. And the best example I can offer, of you, offer you of that is just the distinction between individualistic versus uh, more communal cultures. You know how in the West we value the rugged individual who's fiercely independent and strikes out on their own? Well, in the East, as you know, in Asian culture where they value community and cooperation, they have a saying that the nail that sticks out will get hammered back in. The idea being that uh, that which makes you Donald Trump and a hero in one culture would render you a colossal asshole in another. And, uh, it's, uh, and, and, that, and we can laugh about that, but what's interesting here is that the road to self-esteem is never anything that can be pursued autonomously uh, because what it means to be a person of value is almost always ultimately culturally prescribed. There's very few things besides incest uh, that are universally valued or loathed. And anything that you can tell me that we hate in our society, I can give you another example of a society that loves it. And I just think there's something interesting about that uh, that ought to concern us. But we don't have time to linger on that too much, so let's get to our central concern uh, for today, uh, which is this notion of culture uh, being a means uh, to deny death. I should point out, by the way, ju just in passage, that uh, on this piece of paper that you should definitely stare at at some point, that that's what Berger and Luckman are doing in this social construction or reality thing. But I think more revealingly is what Alf Alfonso Ortiz, the Tiwa Indian down there from New Mexico, is saying. Uh, this is in the October 1994 issue in National Geographic. Uh, the Tiwas are in the southwest in New Mexico. And so let's read what Alfonso says. A Tiwa is interested in our own story of our origin, for it holds all that we need to know about our people and how one should live as a human. The story defines our society. It tells me who I am, where I came from, the boundaries of my world, what kind of order exists within it, how suffering, evil, and death came into this world, and what is likely to happen to me when I die. And so note that here's Ortiz never having had a class in his life, right? The ultimate wisdom does not require the academy as you're painfully aware, uh, although we try and hide that from our students as professor types. Uh, but uh, here's Alfonso saying the same thing. This is what culture does for us. It is the psychological ballast upon which our uh, equilibrium rightfully depends. But it only works if besides meaning and value, culture can purchase what we're really after, and that's immortality, either symbolically, don't knock anything over, or 
I, either in, symbolically or literally. So let's talk about the denial of death. Let me find a place on the board here. And, and let's think about this in two ways, at the level of symbol. So let's think about it symbolically and, and then literally. And, and what Becker points out is that with a few important exceptions that are necessary for us to understand that all cultures that we're aware of offer their constituents some hope of immortality, either symbolically or literally. At the symbolic level, Plato talked about this whenever he was breathing a long time ago in, in Greece. Uh, and what Plato said is, hey, one of the reasons why people like to do big stuff, like build big buildings, write symphonies, have shit tons of money, is that while you know that you will not be here forever, there is some comfort in the knowledge that a physical manifestation of you remains nevertheless, right? That's why whenever some rich guy buys a building, what's the first thing he usually does? Yeah, you name it after yourself. If I see one more Trump building, you don't have Donald Trump. Uh, you know who I'm talking about? In New York, every block is like Trump Tower, Trump's Pizza Parlor, Trump, 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 Trump. And there's more Trumps than Rockefeller stuff now. But the point is, for Plato, that's even one of the reasons why we have kids. The, the notion that any kid people here, who's got kids? I never thought that was true until I saw my own mini replicas. I'm like, oh, here are my, my kids. <laughs> There's me, the bottom of the gene pool has, has been reached once again. But, but Plato said, hey, at the symbolic level, uh, you realize that you're not going to be here, but there's going to be some vestige of your existence that remains nevertheless. Right, but a as you know, we also take this quite literally through what dominant social institution? Where do you get literal immortality? Yeah, from religion typically. As you know, we'll just do this very quickly. Uh, most religious traditions offer hope of literal immortality. In the, in the Christian tradition, life may suck on earth, but if you do the right thing, you qualify for immortality, whether you be a dipstick for a cesspool or the president of IBM. It doesn't matter. Everybody can win. Uh, same thing in Eastern thought. The, uh, you go through a successive series of reincarnations until you get it right, and then what do you reach? Nirvana, at which point you don't have to keep coming back as a carcass. You can hang out in this ephemeral mist that I look forward uh, to becoming uh, forever. It rules. Immortality rules. It's big. All right, then, that, that's what these guys are suggesting. All right, so now the issue becomes, okay, well, so what? Uh, if you grant that these ideas are important, or if you even grant momentarily uh, that there's some validity to them, uh, what implications does all of this have uh, for helping us to understand uh, about ourselves and the world around us? And uh, what Becker says is, look, I think what we should do, or at least one of the things that he suggests, is that we look at different cultures and our own in order to develop better ones. What he says is, look, all cultures pretty much do the same thing. They are vehicles to help us understand the nature of the world around us and to provide us with opportunities to feel good about ourselves in the service of perceiving uh, that we might someday uh, be immortal. But having said that, uh, Becker vehemently opposes the notion of cultural relativity. Have they talked about that uh, or the use of that term? Yeah. Okay, uh, have you heard the term cultural relativity before? That's just this idea that every culture is different and there's no grounds to make judgments between them uh, because they're all just different. Becker rejects that unequivocally. He just says, look, I, I, that, me speaking for him, he says, I think that that's bullshit. I think you can and must make judgments uh, about the relative utility of different kinds of cultures with regard to the extent that they help us live and to the extent that they help us die. And what he goes on to do is to say, well, okay, uh, what do we mean when we talk about a culture being potentially better than another? 